Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's video, we're going to look at a concept called opportunistic rebalancing. It's an approach to rebalancing your investment portfolio that isn't based simply on time. Certainly one could rebalance their portfolio, say, once a year, and that's a perfectly reasonable approach. But with opportunistic rebalancing, we have an opportunity to actually increase our returns uh, through rebalancing. And the concept is based uh, on this paper, Opportunistic Rebalancing, a New Paradigm uh, for Wealth Managers. This was published uh, a few years ago, actually, 2008. It's based on data from 1992 to 2004, which is actually, I think, a good time period because we saw uh, some booms and some busts uh, during those periods. So we kind of got a full economic cycle. And that was the time period that they used for the study. I will leave a link to the paper below the video, but we're going to walk through it uh, in this uh, video. And uh, I'm going to show you how to implement it in your portfolio, some things to consider. And I'm even going to mention a free tool you can use that can help you uh, do it. So with that, let's get started. And I want to begin with the concept. So let's go to the whiteboard. And let's imagine we're using a, uh, an asset allocation that includes, oh, we'll just say US large cap stocks, and, and we have, we'll just say 30% uh, allocated to that asset class. Uh, so with opportunistic rebalancing, what we do is we decide ahead of time uh, how much will allow that asset class to drift. That is, over time, the market's open, uh, asset classes, they move up, they move down. And so while we may have started with 30% in our portfolio of U.S. large cap stocks, over time, that number is going to drift up or down, depending on how stocks do. And so the question with opportunistic rebalancing that we have to, to answer is, how far will we allow any given asset class to drift before it triggers uh, rebalancing? And what the paper concluded was, the best, and they call it a rebalancing band, is 20%, meaning we'll allow th this asset class and all of our asset classes to drift upward by 20% or down by 20% before we rebalance. So what's 20% of 30 is six. So we would allow this ac asset class to get as high as 30%, 36% of our total portfolio before rebalancing. And on the downside, we'd let it go 30 minus 6 is 24. So we'd let it go all the way down to 24% before rebalancing. And so we get this, what they call, again, it's a rebalancing band, or just RB. And so as the stock market moves and fluctuates, uh, this asset class in our portfolio might move up and down. And as long as it stays within this rebalancing band, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to rebalance. And in fact, it might stay in that band for years. Keep in mind, the, the, the 6% up or down isn't uh, absolute for the asset class. It's how much it represents on our portfolio as a whole. So stocks might be up 20%, but if our other asset classes are up as well, our, our, this particular asset class may still stay within this rebalancing band. And we might go months, maybe even more than a year uh, without rebalancing. However, if this asset class ends up going either above 36% in this case, or below 24%, that would trigger a rebalance. Now, one of the big questions is, all right, once you trigger a rebalance, what do you rebalance to? And there are actually a, a couple of different approaches. We can use the whiteboard and I can show you. One approach is to say, if you go above or below the band, you're only gonna rebalance back to the band back to the top level here. Or if you go below it, you'd rebalance back to the bottom band. That's one approach. Another approach is to say, no, no, we want to get this exact. We're going to go all the way back to 30% or whatever our asset allocation is for that asset class. We're going to go right back to our original plan. In the study that I showed you a minute ago, Opportunistic Rebalancing a New Paradigm for Wealth Managers, uh, that study didn't take either of those approaches. What it did was said, hey, let's do uh, uh, something in between. So what it said was, whatever your, ba your band is, we're going to cut it in half. So in this case, we'll put the line right down the middle. So 3%. Since we went up a total of 6% for the top band, this they called it a tolerance band, would be right down the middle. So 3%, in this case, up to be 33%, right? 
And on the downside, we'd have one right down the middle. And that would be what, 26%, per, 27%, if I got my math right. And so what the study said was, we're not going to go to either extreme. We're not going to balance just to the band. We're not going to rebalance all the way to the, to the original asset allocation. If we go above this, we're going to rebalance to the tolerance band. And if we go below, and that triggers the rebalancing, we'll rebalance to this tolerance band. And you might say, well, why, why does he suggest that in his study? Part of it has to do with taxes. If you have some of your investments in a taxable uh, account, uh, rebalancing can trigger taxes. And so the thought is, we want to rebalance, but we also want to manage the tax liability. And his study found, I'm going to show you the results in a minute, that rebalancing back to this tolerance band was good enough. And so uh, we can look at this, whoops, here we go. We can look at this uh, with different asset allocations. For example, if I clear this page, let's imagine our, our we have an asset class that's 40%. Of our portfolio. We would do the same math. 20% of 40 would take us at the top side to 48, on the bottom side to 32. So those would be our rebalancing bands. And our and our and our tolerance band, we'll we'll put the 40% right here, is again just half of that, right? Or 44. And in this case, half of that or 36. So that's how it would work. You could do this with a, a, an asset class that has 5% of your portfolio, 50%, it doesn't matter. It's the same method. And that's what we would do to create our rebalancing bands for each of our asset classes. And then of course, they would each have tolerance bands. Now, having gone to all this trouble, it raises the question, well, what do we get for all of this? What's the benefit? And uh, let's take a look at the study. He looked at this a number of different ways, but the primary table to look at is table one. And uh, let me just walk through this table. He was looking again from 1992 to 2004. We see that right here. Here were the different rebalancing uh, bands that he considered. Um, and you look at the extremes and um, that could be either uh, not re really rebalancing at all or rebalancing back to your plan basically every single day. But the focus was more in, in, in between rebalancing bands from 5 to 25%. Now, what do these numbers across the top mean? 250 and 125 and so on. He, he asked the question, once we've set up our rebalancing bands, how often should we look at our portfolio uh, to decide whether the rebalancing band has been triggered and we need to rebalance? And he considered periods from 250 market days, stock, you know, days the stock market's open, so that's effectively roughly about a year, all the way down to looking every single day, this is number one over here, every single day the market's open, right? And here's what he found. You can see it down here. And the yellow is really the sweet spot. So what he found was you're going to get the most bang for your buck if your rebalancing band is 20%, which was the example I used just a minute ago, and that you look at your portfolio either every market day, every fifth market day, or every 10th market day, which would effectively be uh, every two weeks. And you can see the benefit he shows is upwards to a half a percent uh, in, in increased returns uh, for all of your effort. And if you follow this channel long enough, you know that a half a percent is a, a huge difference uh, when multiplied over decades of investing. So back to the table, that's what he found. Now, there are a few caveats. Uh, he looked at different trends as well. So he, he looked at five-year periods during this 92 to 2004 time period. He looked at 10-year periods. And you'll see those in the tables if you go to this paper. You'll look, he looked at different intervals. Here's a five-year interval. And there are certainly time periods, and this is actually is an example where you see negative numbers. He did look at periods where uh, the rebalancing actually reduced the value of your portfolio, particularly if certain asset classes are trending up or perhaps trending uh, down, where he found the best benefit from rebalancing was in certain volatile markets and or relatively flat markets. However, table one sort of shows uh, the total over the entire period. I stress that to say there can be some periods of time where rebalancing, even among different stock asset classes like emerging markets, international, small caps, and so on, REITs, 
uh, will actually reduce the value of your portfolio. But what this study found was over the long period of time, at least the 12 years he, he evaluated, including both during that time, uh, very uh, bull markets up leading up to the tech bubble and then, and then the tech bubble burst. So uh, through good and bad markets over the long period of time, he found that this approach to rebalancing can increase your performance by as much as 50 basis points. So pretty significant. The other thing I like about it, it seems complicated, but once you sort of um, understand it and follow it, it's really, I think, fairly easy to follow. The thing that I like about it is while you do look at your portfolio perhaps more frequently, you don't actually rebalance a lot. In fact, he found that even looking at your portfolio every single day to see if the rebalancing bands had been triggered really only resulted from to uh, really only resulted to rebalancing a couple of times a year. And of course, there could be some periods of time where you might not rebalance at all during the year. And I like that, particularly for, for us, and maybe this is you as well, where some of our investments uh, are in taxable accounts. Now, there are a couple of things to consider, uh, and they're very important in structuring your portfolio. The first is, he found that these rebalancing benefits occur when you have at least five asset classes represented by five different uh, funds. For example, take an extreme. If you put all of your money in a target date retirement fund, and that may be a perfectly reasonable approach and certainly an easier approach to investing, well, opportunistic rebalancing is, is not obviously not going to be relevant. You just have one uh, fund and the fund itself does the rebalancing. And frankly, the same may be true if you follow the three fund uh, approach. Again, a very reasonable and I think solid way to invest. But I think the benefits from opportunistic rebalancing probably won't be as significant for that kind of portfolio. However, if you have a five fund or the portfolio I follow, six fund portfolio, that's uh, U.S. stocks, many large caps, small caps, uh, REITs, emerging markets, uh, developed international uh, country uh, investments, and bonds, then opportunistic rebalancing uh, could be a big, big benefit. The second thing to keep in mind is asset location. Where do you hold uh, the investments that you have? And, and specifically, between retirement accounts on the one hand and taxable accounts on the other, frankly, one of the mistakes I made is putting all of our U.S. stock allocation, a very efficient type of investment, in taxable accounts. I'm slowly correcting that mistake, but the problem it creates is that whenever I need to rebalance that asset class by selling it, it triggers taxes. If I had kept some of that asset class in retirement accounts, I could have rebalanced it uh, without triggering taxes. So that's a really important point to keep in mind particularly for those of you that have significant investments in taxable accounts. Now, I know I've gone through this fairly quickly. I'll leave a link to the paper uh, below the video. It is a fairly straightforward concept, and I've grown to really like it as an approach to rebalancing. I did promise you that I'd show you a free tool you can use uh, uh, to make this easier. And let me show you that uh, now. Uh, this is an investment tracking spreadsheet. I've had videos on it in the past. It's a free spreadsheet that I created. And I'll leave a link to this article that walks through it. You can get the spreadsheet here. There's a link to it in the article. And uh, one thing that I want to point out about this spreadsheet, it uses Google Sheets. And um, every day, people click this share button over here and ask that I share, give them access to this spreadsheet. Well, I don't do that. This is the template. Uh, we, can't, we can't change it. So if you want to use it, just go to File and make a copy right here. And you can get your own copy that only you have access to, and you can... You can make any changes you want to it. And I'll leave a link to the video that walks through how to use it. But basically, you have a holdings tab where you can put all of your holdings. This is just a, a demo account with um, some Vanguard funds. And I even threw in some Apple stock and Berkshire stock to show you how you might use this if you have individual stocks as well. But if we go over to the second, the first tab by asset class, you can see here that there's a column called threshold. So this is where you can basically implement those rebalancing bands that I talked about. And for here, for this particular target allocation of 25%, 20% uh, um, of that number would be, you guessed it, 5%. And so you can, you can use whatever rebalancing band you want. In, in this investment uh, tracking spreadsheet, I use 20%. So I simply take 20% of each of these numbers and use them as the threshold. And you can see that when the threshold is exceeded, this shows you the difference, by more than, in this case, 
uh, so here it's exceeded its 3.41%. Uh, uh, the cell turns red. That indicates to you, uh, okay, a, a rebalancing has been triggered. And it even shows you the amount uh, that you need in this case to sell in order to rebalance. So it's a free spreadsheet. Hopefully it'll be helpful to you. Again, I'll leave links both to the article uh, below the video and I'll, I'll link to the video I did in the past uh, in this channel to sort of walk through this spreadsheet in more detail. Uh, I find this sort of the easiest way to sort of track opportunistic rebalancing and it's really, really quite simple. So there you go. I know I've thrown a lot at you. Hopefully you find this helpful. I'll leave links to everything below the video. If you have questions or comments, uh, just leave them uh, below the video. I'll do my best to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.